Secretly, I'm socially awkward. I have ways of acting normal and smooth, but the lack of structure and role modeling that defined my childhood, I had to teach myself how to connect with people and things didn't really snap together until I learned how to heal my childhood PTSD symptoms. When I was learning about CPTSD, Nobody talked about social awkwardness, but it's totally a trauma thing. And I learned that when I put out my four part series on isolation and loneliness a few years ago. And I was watching these videos again the other day and I was thinking, I have got to bring these back. They are just as relevant today as they were back when I made them. And especially today, I want to share with you this video I made on complex PTSD and social awkwardness. Have you ever been to a hotel? where there's a person who's there to carry your bags for you. And even though you didn't ask, they carry your bags to the room and it's totally awkward. And you think I'm supposed to give them a tip, right? I've seen this on TV, but you don't have cash. And they're just standing there and you think, what do I do? What do I say? And instead of saying anything, you just say, okay, bye. And then you shut the door and then you feel like a real a-hole. Or maybe you're the person who carried the bags and you're not really supposed to ask for the tip and there's some right amount of time to just stand there waiting for it. But if you have childhood PTSD and you're vulnerable to feeling shame and you're getting all dysregulated over this, just like the person who's supposed to give you the tip and then you get the door shut in your face. Well, now we've got two people on either side of the door just flooding with shame and they're not able to say a word. And this kind of awkwardness happens all the time for those of us who experience trauma in childhood. The shame we feel in awkward social situations makes us collapse inside and we want to flee the interaction and isolate. This is my third video in the isolation series and it's all about social awkwardness and how to navigate it so we can more gracefully handle awkward situations and avoid the need to isolate. Now, social awkwardness doesn't always go hand in hand with childhood PTSD and complex PTSD, but early trauma put such a huge dent in our confidence and family homes where there was abuse or neglect or drugs or grinding poverty are not usually the greatest places to learn how to handle yourself with other people. So a lot of us end up having no idea how to act in challenging situations. Things like when you're in a formal environment or you've been accused of something you didn't do or you happen to be in a room with someone famous or you win a prize or you lose a prize and you're expected to congratulate the winner or when a family member says something really offensive. This stuff can be so fraught for us with childhood PTSD. And so many of us never get taught how you do this? How do you deal with awkward situations gracefully without shutting down or making a scene? And so this is one more reason why people with early trauma have such a tendency to isolate, to withdraw from connection and relationships with people, even though they long for those things. It's one of the worst consequences of childhood PTSD. And if you don't turn it around, you could end up going deeper into isolation. And whatever dodgy personality traits you may already have, we all have some, right? Isolation is only gonna make them worse. Now remember, isolation is not the same as periods of constructive solitude. Solitude can be calming, but ongoing isolation makes us deteriorate. We get weird. It's really important to break this cycle and learn again how to reconnect. Now, personally, I grew up with educated parents who themselves had been raised by polite and conscientious parents, and I learned to say please and thank you and all that. But because there was alcoholism, there was not a lot of attention or supervision given to us kids, and we were inconsistently disciplined, and we were rarely called out for rude and selfish behavior. I also was missing a lot of the just basic skills of social behavior. I was 12 years old when I taught myself to use a knife and a fork together. Until that time, I had a more intuitive way of eating, if you could call it that, that usually involved scooping up food with a spoon or a fork in my hand and then tipping my head back while I chewed it so it didn't fall out while I chewed with my mouth open. And all the siblings did it, and it was all we knew. No one minded. And it was only when I started to feel shame about my manners when I was at other people's homes that I tried to figure out how you're supposed to do this. Being neglected can bring out some ugly traits. The seriousness of drug and alcohol problems in the family kept us all tangled up in chaos. And in that situation, a kid kind of has to be selfish to get by. If you're not getting attention 
and praise sometimes, you might start to show off to other people. I know I did. If you don't get treated fairly, you might become kind of pushy to get what you want or arrogant or sharp-tongued or dismissive of others. And if you're not cared for when you're sick or your feelings are hurt, you might start talking about these hardships to anyone who will listen, like too much. So how can we teach ourselves to be more socially graceful? I used to read etiquette books, but if they're written by people from normal families, they kind of skip over that very elementary part that I actually need to, of just like, how do you even begin? My parents were pretty decent people, then despite the chaos, but I got very little guidance on how to be. And so starting in my teens, I sought out and connected with socially graceful people. And I wasn't usually courageous enough to ask for help, but I watched them. I, I listened to what to say. When is it appropriate to speak up? When should I pull back? And what I've learned has helped me to be less isolated and help me not be limited to the company of only other screwed up people and more flexible to hang out with just about any kind of person. And that's what social grace is. It's having the choice to connect with a wide variety of people wherever you care to be. And remember, social grace doesn't mean you tolerate abuse and um, that you stand there just like helplessly when you're in danger. These guiding principles will help you to create a feeling of ease and welcome with people around you when you want that with them. And that will allow your connection to blossom. I'm going to give you some guiding principles that will help you create a feeling of ease and welcome with the people around you and to create the opportunity for more connection to blossom. And here they are. First, be gentle with other people. Remember that they may be as sensitive as you are. Second, be trustworthy. People need to feel safe to grow closer to you or anyone. And third, be humble. Help others feel your respect for them by keeping at least half the focus on what they're saying and how they're feeling. Really paying attention to others not only makes them feel heard, but it will help you learn to genuinely appreciate who they are. When you're in a social situation, even as the many colors of your personality start to shine much brighter, the art of being gentle, trustworthy, and humble will create a positive environment for connection to grow. You will find doors opening for you socially all around you, and into your life will come other socially graceful people whose company will feel so much kinder and easier and more supportive than anything you ever had. There's a stereotype around codependence that it's something that kind of passively just happens to people who are in the lives of people who are selfish or narcissistic or addicted or energy vampires of some kind or another. And the belief is that they just take from codependence and codependent people just let it happen. But I've noticed that codependent behavior, the role that a codependent person plays is anything but passive. Like most people who went through abuse and neglect as a kid, I have some codependent tendencies, not all the time, not in every relationship, but sometimes little ways and occasionally big ways have really been incredibly damaging. And what I've noticed is that the stereotype that codependent people just give too much and are taken advantage of, it just doesn't really describe it. It's more like a codependent person puts their energy into another person, like forces it, injects themselves into fixing or helping or just generally moving the center of their lives into another person's life. And the reason they do it, as I see it, is to set up that other person to feed them the energy that their codependent tendencies crave. It doesn't always work, but the goal of all that focus on someone, just focus, focus on someone else, is to get something from them. A feeling, something they are missing in themselves, whether it's security, feeling seen, heard, validated, a sense of purpose, a sense of identity. These are all things that they ought to be finding and creating themselves, but with codependent behavior, they're effectively stealing these things from another person. They're latching onto them and trying to then suck something back out. So I've been talking a lot about energy vampires and some people just directly try to stir up a bunch of energy and then take it. It could be people who stir up romantic energy and then you know get to enjoy that flood of romantic energy and then they run away. But with codependence, I think it's it's similar actually. It's where you get you 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 go in and put your energy into somebody else and try to make them change because doing that gives you energy. So it's the same sort of thing, and it is like a theft, romantic shoplifting is what I call it. So I realize this is a kind of apocryphal view of codependence, 
But that's how I experience it when codependents try to attach their hooks to me, to people please me, or to get my approval. And I think this view might be helpful to know as I read a letter I received this week from a woman I'll call Chloe. All right, she writes, Hi, Anna, your videos on isolation, limerence, and abandonment are striking a very relevant nerve in my life, and I have applied the, them in order to heal my dysfunctional and usually non-existent romantic life. It's improved it somewhat, but I'm still stuck in this loop that I just recently identified with the help of a friend. I find myself attracted to unavailable people, which is very common for CPTSD, I know. But when a person who is available and present and listens to me and asks about me and generally displays good partner characteristics shows interest in me, my instinctive action is to make them into a friend. Attraction doesn't even register in my brain. Circling here, it's interesting things I want to come back to. I'm going to read all the way through this letter. We'll come back and go through again, and I will then try to help you, Chloe, to see what's happening here. All right. So attraction doesn't even register in my brain. I immediately jump to friend zoning people who are appropriate. I also must add that by them showing interest in me, it makes my romantic attraction falter. I grew up with loving and providing and selfless parents, but my father was and still is an emotionally unavailable workaholic, and my mother is an enabler, codependent, people pleaser. I love them, but I was never heard, seen, or understood growing up. There is a lot of shame within me that originates from this point. The type of person I go for tends to be someone who doesn't listen to me and who only really talks about themselves, which is what my father did and does. But they are always intelligent and can hold an engaging conversation. I don't have many people like this in my life. I get attached almost immediately, not exclusively to men with these traits, but when they do act in this way, I completely bulldoze my needs and listen to them in adoration. I ask lots and lots of questions about every story, opinion, make myself overly available for them, bend over backwards, making their life easier, but most destructively, dedicate all my thinking time toward them and daydreaming of a future where we're together. It's particularly in their absence where I fantasize and desperately wait for them. Around November, I met a friend of a guy I also had this experience with, but it never developed, who I connected with. We had a long conversation and he drove me home. He asked to come up and I said no. The following day I cooked a lot of vegetarian food. He's veg. And he was in the area so I offered him a takeaway box. He tried to come to my house again but I said no. And we ended up having a three hour deep conversation, mostly about him, where he became very vulnerable and I was hooked. After our first date we had sex and then proceeded to discard me short replies, making excuses to not meet, etc. This was on the more extreme side, but the pattern I found is that men who are not as available are placed on pedestals. On the flip side, when someone shows me interest, it works for the first date, but I begin resenting them after that. Quick example, I met an intelligent and kind man who displayed a lot of interest in me. We had an incredible first date, but after I left, I had a foul taste in my mouth about him. He irritated me every time he tried to initiate something or say anything remotely flirty, but I really enjoyed talking to him. Ultimately, I found myself treating him like a friend and becoming severely avoidant every time he tried to push towards something more romantic, albeit very respectfully. I very quickly lost attraction and interest toward him and discarded him in a very regrettable way and without integrity. On the lesser side, my now best male friend, who I maintain a platonic and emotionally enriching intimate friendship with, was initially someone I pursued. I really want nothing more than a relationship. It preoccupies my mind and is the one wish I make when I get an opportunity. It really bogs me why I cannot seem to enter one and why I constantly sabotage myself. I think it's also worth adding that my most recent friendships have been very similar and in which the friends I felt most comfortable with were controlling and revolving primarily around them. I, a lot of them have discarded me in the past year. My question is this, why do I instinctively wish to make a good, healthy, romantic candidate into a friend? Why, in the face of every bit of logic, do I keep abandoning myself when a man who is self-absorbed and or unavailable enters my life? I believe I'm a smart person and I absorb a lot of wisdom from you and my therapist and other healers, but this pattern keeps on happening and it really burns. And then what practical steps can I take to fit 
to lift the veil of friendship, even if I've lost interest in them for being available. Any advice or tough love is appreciated. Okay, Chloe, I gotcha. All right, let's go through and I'll tell you what I heard. I think this is kind of a challenging case. I think this is a tough one. So first of all, when you describe your family, this is so interesting, okay? You said that you grew up with a loving and providing and selfless parents, but your father was and still is emotionally unavailable workaholic, which is not loving or providing or selfless, okay? And your mother is an enabler, codependent people pleaser, also not loving, not selfless. You know, the, the, that's, that, that's pretty disordered and it leads to a person like you not feeling heard and seen. And you know, I have a theory about that. Um, I don't, there may be research about this, but you know how mirror neurons are necessary to start learning to have empathy and to read other people. And if a baby is neglected by their parent, they don't get that reflection of like, you know, faces, eyes, the parent imitates the noises the baby makes. That's how our brains develop. And I think when we're seen and heard as babies and probably a little older, that's also how we develop a sense of self. We develop a sense of self. And so my instinct about you, Chloe, is that you have a, a delay. I call it a developmental delay. That's not really the word for it, but it is where your sense of self is very late in arriving. And that's what's missing here. And that's why you're trying to borrow other people's selves, that that feels like that thing that's missing in you. That's my theory for you. So let me tell you why I think so. We'll keep going. All right. The person you go for tends to be someone who doesn't listen to you and only really talks about themselves, which is what your father did and does. And I know, you know, we have this kind of simplistic idea that we were trying to match what happened when we were kids. Maybe, or maybe there really is like something neurologically nourishing for you when somebody does that, that you can see somebody being very in touch with themselves. And that feels good for you to be around because you haven't yet got it for yourself, that they have sort of a, um, an energy, they're demonstrating for you something, and immediately your idea of yourself can kind of leap into that and you can see how you would be if you develop that. So that, that's my hunch about you, is that your spirit is crying for you to have that in yourself where you're very in touch with yourself, you know who you are, you hear yourself, you see yourself, and because you're visible and you're sort of like fully manifested like that, other people can see and hear you too. Um, what's the word? Materialize. To materialize who you really are, to really come in your body, in the person that people encounter, that you are there. That's what I'm hearing. So you get attached almost immediately. And not exclusively to men with these traits, but when they do, you act it, you completely bulldoze your own needs and listen to them in adoration. And you ask lots and lots of questions about every story and opinion. And I'm just wondering, I've known people who did this and I really didn't like it. And somebody who um, I think had similar traits of what you're talking about. I had a friend like that who would always ask me questions, questions, questions. And I assumed, you, you helped me to see that it might be something different than what I assumed. I assumed it was because she thought that that's how you be a good conversationalist. But that's actually, like for me, I get dysregulated. If I get peppered with questions, I absolutely hate it. I shut down. I don't like it. I like a normal amount of questions. I like an exchange and a give and take. But I don't like it when somebody keeps asking me questions because they think that's going to help. But I would think, I think in the case of this friend I'm thinking of, yeah, they had had a lot of trouble with narcissists and self-centered people. And that was their way of relating to people they liked and admired, was to go ahead and put them up on a pedestal and make it all about them. And I'm just wondering, like, is it possible that the people who you're attracted to, I don't know, you, you don't think so, so probably not. I defer to you. But is it possible they're actually not that self-centered? It's just that you're causing the conversation to be empty of anything about you if you're just driving it and driving it. And, you know, like Dale Carnegie's book, How to Win Friends and Influence People, pointed out almost 100 years ago, everybody loves to be asked about themselves. And um, I've talked about it in a video here, but once my husband and I did an experiment, we went to a party. We were anxious about this party. I didn't really want to go. We said, let's see, what can we learn something at this party? So we decided we would do an experiment. We would not talk about ourselves unless forced to. We would only ask people about themselves. And we went to like a three hour party where literally no one ever asked us a question about ourselves. They talked about themselves. And what was interesting is at the end of it, they were like, oh, we should hang out sometime. And it was funny because I was sort of just like, 
wow, those people like really never asked about myself. But I had doubts like, should I be talking more about myself? And I don't really have a problem with that. Obviously on this channel, I talk easily about myself and I could easily do it too much. But just like when I try to gauge like how right is it to like always let somebody talk about themselves, I don't think it's right. I think it's manipulative. It's like trying to make somebody like you, right? So really showing up honestly is going to be a give and take that's going to be influenced by how extroverted or introverted or expressive people are or anxious. You know, personality and circumstances will influence it, but a good relationship, people will just sort of naturally reveal who they are and be interested in, in each other. And you haven't had that yet. It's always one way or the other. You know what else I want to say, Chloe? I just think that um, you are attracted to people who are full of themselves like that, full of themselves. And I want to put that in a positive way. And I think that that's not necessarily like a terrible thing. It's just that it's way out of balance without you showing up. It's okay. You know, these guys that you're talking about who, you know, they like you and it turns you off. Well, you're just not attracted to them. And here's the thing. You could go on dates with a hundred people and not be attracted to any of them. That's normal and okay. It's okay. It only takes one for lightning to strike for somebody that you really would like to be with and it's mutual and it works out. So most of the people that you hang out with in a dating way, they're just not going to be the one. So don't even worry. I, I'm going to just give you a little validation. Attracted, not attracted. And you like a certain type of guy. Maybe it's like more of an alpha type guy. You know, maybe that's what it is. It's not really some big sick thing. It's just a, you like alpha guys and you have this misunderstanding that you need to dance around and people please them to get them to talk about themselves and you don't feel like you're interesting enough or good enough to be talking to. And that's, that's how you're kind of sabotaging. I think, I think the problem here might not be as global as you think it is. You'll be the one to decide, of course. So you also say that um, a negative side of when you sort of put a guy on a pedestal is you dedicate all this thinking time towards them and daydreaming of a future where you're together. And it's particularly when they're not around that you do that. Well, that's how it works. <laughs> a little bit of limerence there. And again, I'm not going to say that that's totally crazy or sick. If you like somebody, you know, you're going to fantasize a little bit about them and think about the future. A little bit of that is fine. And of course you do it when they're not around. Because when they are around, you're actually confronted with the real person. And the real person is flawed and human and you know, <laughs> gets in the way and interrupts and whatever it is, you know, there, it's a harder to be limerent when a real person is right there in your midst. But, um, many of us are, you know, hanging out and being just friends with people that we pine for or whatever that's possible. But so I hear you, it goes a little too far. You fantasize and desperately wait for them. So the pedestal, the waiting, you know, you are describing a pattern, you're describing a pattern. And what I've noticed is that any kind of thing where we're putting people on pedestals and getting limerent about them, it is a, it's a known pattern that people have. It comes back into focus when you begin to bring your life into focus and richness. So I'm guessing you didn't tell me much about your life, but there it is. You didn't tell me like, what do you do? How old are you? What you didn't even tell me about yourself. So I don't really know. I can just tell you need more fun and you need more fun that you have independently of whether some guy is around. So I'll talk about that in a minute. So you met another guy and he liked you and he wanted to come up and you weren't into it. I thought it was interesting that this guy liked you and he drove you home and he came up and the next day you cooked him food and offered to bring it to him. So I haven't gone on a date in a long time, but when I did date, I would not have done that unless I was absolutely really into somebody. So I think it's interesting that you weren't into him and you did that thing. I think when you're not into somebody, like cooking them saying, don't know, I don't want to sleep with you. And then the very next day, cooking something for them and bringing it to them in a takeout box, it's kind of codependent. It just feels that way to me. It's a little too much. So I think that's interesting. So that's your strategy to try to have relationships with people is like to overdo for them, to be very nice, to listen to them. That's your strategy. You're just still, you know, working on developing is who you are enough? Is it enough to just let some guy call you when he feels like calling you if he'd like to see you again and then show up and not feel like you have to cook for him or anything? That's, I, you'd barely even know him, you know, but, but yeah. So then after that, the next day you guys got together, had sex, and then he got weirded out and he discarded you and he stopped, you know, short replies. So, um, you didn't describe that very fully, but I'm just guessing if you liked him enough to have sex with him, 
I think you might have done the thing where you were just like bombarding him with questions and blah, blah, blah. And you know what? When you're not you and you're trying to take your energy and push it into somebody else's mind, it is not attractive. To a healthy person, that's going to be like off-putting. So I think, you know, you kind of rushed in there with him and it pushed him away. And I think you, I think you're aware of that. I think if you had been a little bit like more pace measured about it, he did like you. Maybe that was going to happen. But you know what? If anybody really, really likes you, this sort of shenanigans, it doesn't really get in the way. So don't worry. You're just dating. It's going to constantly just collapse and turn into nothing because you haven't met the one yet. So don't worry. Don't worry. Have patience. Um, on the flip side, someone shows interest and you begin resenting them after that. I know what that's like. And you know, it's a symptom that you're not yet emotionally available. You can grow into someone who's emotionally available. One thing you can do is to stop hanging out with guys you're not interested in. If there's a non-mutual attraction there, don't hang out. I know it's radical, but if you want to become emotionally available, you get out of those like halfway relationships because what they do is they just, they suck your availability out of you. I'm all about like energy sucks this week. You lose that beautiful radiant energy that's attractive to somebody who, who might want a serious relationship with you when you're kind of just like l leaking all your energy into all these quasi relationships. I like him. He doesn't like me. He likes me. I don't like him. It's, um, it drains you. It drains you and keeps you from being, t from letting your cab light shine. Your cab light, that's the phrase for, you know, like a taxi cab. The light comes on when it's available. And you know how that happens sometimes? Like sometimes you want to be dating and nothing happens. And then one day, boom, something happens and everybody's asking you out. Or at least one person is. I never was in an everybody situation, but, you know, it begins to happen. And it's, it's a little mysterious why it does. But that's part of it because your emotional availability is sort of together right there. And people feel that. We can say anything we want. We can ask them questions and pretend that we're, you know, so obsequious and listening to them and everything. But people feel you. And they feel when you, if they can feel desperation, they can feel resentment, they feel it. So no matter what you're saying and how you're acting, that your vibe is just communicating where you're coming from. The only people who can't feel are people who are like really intoxicated or very, very out of touch with their feelings. And I think that's one reason why people with CPTSD who are functionally not emotionally available right now do end up with these broken people so often. I know I did. And I think that's why. I wasn't trying to recreate my childhood. It's just that somebody who was high was the only person who wanted to be around my difficult, unavailable, hedgy, prickly personality. You know, I didn't really want to be there. And they didn't mind. They didn't mind. So that worked for me. <laughs> until it didn't. Until I really, you know, grew into a place where I really wanted to, I wanted to get married. I wanted to um, settle down. And I wanted somebody who really loved me and who was going to stay forever. And there was a lot I had to change for that. So. You turn them into a friend. You friend zone them. But that's, I don't think there's anything you can do about that. <laughs> I don't. I think we don't always have control over who we're attracted to or who we fall in love with. I think that the, the guys who are attractive to you, I think with a little bit of healing, you can meet halfway with them a little better. I think that's how it's going to happen for you. So you say you want nothing more than a relationship. It preoccupies your mind. And it's, you know, it's always what you think about when you think, can I make a wish? Like what, blowing out the candles? Oh, I wish I would have a relationship. I get that. Yeah. So it's your heart's desire. So that's good. You have this pattern with friends too. And that's, what's great to know. So you have this thing where you feel like you have to do that. You learned it gr growing up. You were growing up with parents who couldn't hear you or see you. You didn't get a chance to like clarify your own being to yourself. But now you're, you're a grown up and now it's time to do that. So here's how I have had some luck with that. I had um, time. I had chunks of like a year or two years between relationships. And a couple of them in particular were super de new developmental for me, where I learned to spend time by myself doing things I loved, like really, really enjoying my life without having a guy in it. And, you know, I would have my days when I'd be like, oh, I feel so inadequate because I don't have a relationship and everyone else does, which of course they don't. But I discovered stuff that I really love doing. And that was a lot of what was sad for me about not being with somebody is, is that, you know, I wanted to be able to go to like museums. I wanted to be able to go hiking and camping. Do you know what? I've gone camping by myself and it was fabulous. It was really fun. 
And I've traveled, I've gone to all kinds of cities by myself. And what's fun about that is when you don't have a companion with you, you end up interacting with people there. I totally stayed safe. I know how to do that. You know, I was never in any kind of risk or anything, but I went around to cities and I would end up having conversations on the subway or in a meeting or, you know, I just found people and I was so much more ready to engage and meet people. And this made me interesting. And the second thing that made me interesting was I started to read challenging books. And lately I haven't had time for that and I regret it because at the times in my life when I've read challenging books, whatever that is for you, I, I was reading some stuff about philosophy, Aquinas for Beginners, and a book called After Virtue by Alistair McIntyre. They're both like really dense. The, the other one, it says it's for beginners, but it's really dense, like Thomas Aquinas. It was written a long time ago. It's super deep and it was hard to understand, but these are incredible books and just even reading them, even the first day that I began reading them, things would change. My imagination opened up. And when I would have a conversation with people, I had something other than me to talk about. I could talk about, this is what a good conversation is. It's not all about me or all about you. We talk about an idea. You know, we talk about a goal. There are things bigger than both of us that are really, really deep and wonderful to talk about. And that's how people are drawn out of themselves. Yes, we talk about ourselves and self-disclose and ask questions, but that's just part of it. A relationship is built from a common goal or ideal or beginning with ideas that you talk about. So I really encourage you to do that. And I don't know if you read news. News is really complicated. That used to be something I thought was really important, but the thing is it's so negative now that I think that bonding with people over negative feelings about stuff, it's not really the best basis. You can do that later. So bonding over things that you're really, really interested about, that you feel excited and good about, um, or ideas that you're reading about or investigating, that you'll that will completely change the character of the conversations that you have around you and you will begin to grow confidence that you are somebody worth talking to the third thing i would suggest to you is to be somebody who meditates maybe you already do but meditation if you take it seriously will deepen you it will start to bring you into your full self and i've meditated now since 1994 and um, I've had periods where I didn't and I just blew it off, but it's been really helpful on so many levels. As you may know, I teach this thing called the daily practice. It's a free course. I, I think now, I don't know, hundreds of thousands of people have taken it and it's delightful. People all over the world are doing it. It's a very simple set of techniques. One is writing your fears and resentments and it's specific. You should look it up in the course before you try this, but it's a way to get free of those like thoughts you know, anxious, angry thoughts. And that's a lot of what drives unhappy relationship behavior is fearful, anxious thoughts, angry thoughts. And then sitting down in a very simple meditation and just resting. Now, if you have CPTSD, and it sounds like you might, you may get very dysregulated. You, you have a hard time being your grounded self, especially under stress. And you know what's stressful is being around someone you're attracted to. <laughs> so to be able to stay yourself and stay grounded and become somebody that like you're palpable in the room to somebody talking to you, you might want to try these techniques. There's always a link below. There's a link down there. It says free tools. And on my website, Crappy Childhood Fairy, free tools. And there's stuff there that anybody can sign up for for free. So you might want to try that. Your mission, Chloe, if you choose to accept it, is to become more fully yourself. Don't worry about the guys right now. Like take a pause on that. And one reason I say take a pause is because the thing that you do where you discard people is hurting them. And so the thing that's happening to you, you're turning around and doing to other people. I don't want you to have either of those experiences. And it's just bad karma to be hurting other people. So take a year or something. Take some time to try these new things of meditating, getting to know yourself, read challenging books, go learn to do things by yourself that enrich you and give you joy. And you will find the next time you're with a guy you're attracted to that your real self is starting to shine through in a very nice way. How do you feel when you try to take part in a group? It's super common for those of us who grew up with abuse and neglect to feel as adults that we are somehow not quite part of things. Do you have this? where you feel like you're on the outside of groups, kind of in it, kind of not in it, but never really part of it. Or you start as a full participant, but then you pull away over time. You uninclude yourself. I've done this so many times. Now, maybe you're resigned to the fact that groups are just not for you, but belonging 
is important and it's a real need that all people have. So you might be still trying and trying, joining groups, getting uncomfortable or feeling excluded and then dropping out again. And maybe you think in each case that the problem is other people. And sometimes that could be true. But the telltale sign that this could be a personal choice, even when it doesn't feel like it, is that you're almost always at about the same distance from the center. And by that I mean every group has a center, a leader or two who are at the very middle, and then all around them are the people who put a lot of time and energy into the group. And a little further out are the people who are involved and influential, but not as much as the people near the center, and so on. Now in my case, I used to always like to settle at about 80% out from the center. Invited to the party, but not responsible for making the party happen. And a lot of times I'd, I'd start out motivated and thinking, you know what, this group is great. I'm, I finally found my people. I want to be involved with this. And then I'd move towards the very center of the group, maybe take on a more active role, maybe even a leadership role. And then sooner or later, probably sooner, I would find some reason to pull back. I might go to about 40% out of the circle first, but eventually I'd bounce out of the group altogether. So being part of something was, and, and in some areas of my life, it still is really uncomfortable for me. So why is that? I used to think my trouble with groups was just one episode of bad luck after another, the wrong coworkers, the wrong mom's group, the wrong 12 step friends. And I'd think, I guess I'm just really different. These people don't get me. And I never saw that it was a consistent pattern until I had a lot of healing from dysregulation and I started to have some clarity. And it makes sense because being in a group when you have the sensitivities of childhood PTSD can be too much. People are triggering, right? And groups of people, it's like a bunch of triggering people and the group dynamic that brings up all your pain about belonging and fitting in and all the times that that didn't happen. So dealing with a lot of people can be like an assault on your senses and it gets really emotional. It's like a high school experience that just never stops. <laughs> so childhood PTSD, it's not the same thing as introversion, but I suspect there are similarities in that being social with people can take more energy than it gives because you're just working so hard to act normal, to deal with it all, you know? But the thing is when we need people, we need them on a practical level and we need relationships if we're going to start healing the wounds of trauma, which are largely relational wounds. They affect your nervous system, but they were caused by what happened between you and other people, you know, namely your parents. So the healing needs to happen before you have social relationships, but also it needs to happen within social relationships. The little interactions is where you get to practice what you're learning and where you get nourished emotionally, even though sometimes there's pain involved, there's criticism and rejection and genuinely being different in a group where everyone else seems to feel connected. But all that can get easier. So like everyone else, you need a sense of belonging. So it's natural that you'd gravitate to groups, but toward the outer edges at first. It's a little more manageable. You can be around people and be social a little bit, but just keep one foot out the door in case you need to get the heck out of there. It's okay to do that, by the way. Healthy groups have roles and space for many kinds of people, and it's okay not to participate fully for a while. Life would be great if you could keep going like this, just soaking up the group belonging feeling, not risking your emotions by getting too involved. But the problem is that relationships that are all on the periphery of groups make it really hard to develop meaning in your life. You need some friction. You need some contact with people to develop social skills. Everyone needs this. And staying on the periphery keeps contact shallow, so you don't get that. That's what we want at first, is to be out here. That's how we can keep from setting off old triggers, but shallow connections, they take a toll. The connectedness that you crave is more like a future fantasy. And in the present, you're still isolating. And then what starts as a kind of delay in your development can become a full-on deficiency. And next thing you know, you're getting more isolated than ever. That is how it happens. By playing it safe, you stay stuck. You need to be taking some risks to grow your comfort zone a little wider, a little wider. 
There are these normal ups and downs involved in having friends and being part of groups. If you're not continuously growing through experiencing the normal ups and downs of being in friendships and groups, you risk not only not being included anymore, but you can start to get like hard to include. And what it is, and this will sound harsh, but avoiding people leads to self-centeredness. Not sharing yourself with other people, it's an emergency protection measure, but it's not a way to live your whole life. The possibility of sharing yourself is all around you. You can agree to bring something to a potluck dinner, you can join a choir or take a quilting class or invite friends out for a hike. When you show up for people in your life, you grow less fragile and more flexible and more connected and more included. And yes, it's demanding to be included. And isolation sounds so peaceful as an option, but if you allow isolation to take root, long-term it will take over. And your very worst traits will have this huge, fertile, empty space to take root. People in isolation grow crabbier, they get more self-centered, they get more bitter, they get more paranoid. And then it gets harder to turn the ship like back towards connection again because you've gotten too eccentric, too awkward. I've called this turning weird on YouTube before. And some people have complained that I was being unfair, but I think it's fair. I know that isolation definitely made me a weirder version of myself. And I don't mean good weird. Have you ever felt this beginning to happen to you? Have you seen it in other people? I mean, I really noticed it in myself and other people, in fact, when lockdown was ending and I started being able to hang out with people again. I was rough on the edges. I talked too much. I would, wouldn't know what to say. I was a little angry, a little edgy. And gradually I kind of got my bearings again. So take your alone time and then keep chipping away at your capacity to stay connected. I know many of you watching this video are there right now wondering, if any change is possible or worth it. And I just wanna tell you, yes, it is possible and yes, it is worth it. You just start with one small action. You just show up. So I teach a bunch of ways to do this in my Connection Boot Camp. That's a 30-day course that helps you keep taking positive actions each day and you develop new skills for having relationships. You can explore that down in the description section. There's a link down there if you wanna check that out. But for today, take a shower, put on your coat, go say hello to some people, go back to a group you used to like, pay a visit to a friend you've been neglecting, sign up for you know a cleanup day at the beach or a blood drive or whatever community get togethers are just happening. It doesn't have to be really exciting. It just gets you out of the house so that you can show up. And if you do one thing like this every other day, in a couple of weeks, you're gonna find yourself included again. The need to be included is not just a weakness, it's primal. We're born into community and as much as we want to escape it sometimes and be independent, we never can be, not totally, not really. And evolutionary biologists will tell you it's a survival strategy so that you have warmth and food and protection from predators and so on. But it's not just physical. Inclusion is just as important for the growth and development of your being, your intellect, your spirit, because without inclusion in human relationships, the blossoming of, of your whole real self is arrested. It can't fully happen. Fulfillment cannot come to you. So being included and connected is also crucial for your physical health, for your brain health. It wards off dementia. It creates a support system of people who care about you and who can come to your aid if you're broke or lonely or feeling like your life is falling apart. You're not meant to go through all that alone. You've probably done it before, I have, but let's just say right now that we should never have to go through life's hardships alone ever again. Healing can bring that connection back to you. One-on-one -on -one relationships are one thing. If you have childhood PTSD, those can be just as hard as being part of a group. You need both. And I know it feels hard and that's because it is hard but keep trying, keep participating. The reward for that is that you get to be included and included is secretly really what we all want. That's where we wanna be. So if you think your past trauma has affected your ability to connect and take part in groups, you might wanna take my connection quiz and you will find that with some other quizzes on the free tools page of my website. I always have a link to that in the description section near the top. 
We're experiencing an epidemic of loneliness right now, and it was already bad, but when the lockdown started in 2020, it got much worse. And if you're like a lot of people, the way you've maybe always struggled to connect with people took a hit then, and it hasn't gotten easier yet. Conversations with people feel like they're fake or they're halting or it's stilted or awkward. Or maybe you aren't good at small talk, so it's hard to get to know new people. Or you're good at small talk, but you're finding that other people get uncomfortable and conversations that start on a good note just kind of sputter out quickly. And you're standing there in an awkward silence. As hard as it can be to do well, being able to talk to people is fundamental to having a connected life. Learning some basic strategies to open a conversation, to make people feel interested in you and want to talk to you more will serve you all your life and have the added effect of helping other people who might be wonderful potential friends. You'd be helping them to feel better about themselves. And this is good for everyone because the reason so many of us struggle is that without realizing it, we're stopping good conversation before it starts. Do you ever feel like you've done that? You might or might not be aware of it in yourself, but we're all aware of it when it's done to us. So let's talk about these things that we all do sometimes that function as conversation stoppers. And I'll talk you through them, and then I'll go over how you can modify these conversational habits and become someone who puts other people at ease and brings out the best in them. That happens to be the ideal way to begin friendships. Now, some of these will sound very obvious to you, but it pays to remember what not to do. <laughs> okay, so here are common ways that we inadvertently shut down a conversation. One is you miss the cue that someone is trying to connect with you. So let's say your friend has, is having you over for a birthday dinner with her other friends, and you're standing in the living room and someone comes up and says, so how do you know Kristen? And you give them a one word answer, uh, work. And then you just look down <laughs> and you just stopped a conversation. You may have thought their question was just a request for information. I met her at work, but what that person actually gave you was a conversation starter. Now, maybe they felt awkward or they thought you looked like you didn't have anyone to talk to. So they made a bid to connect. Now, a bid is a concept from the Gottman Institute. Um, and this is a group of people who teach about how we make bids for connection. And they do this normally in the context of romantic relationships, but the concept of bids applies to any relationship, even with strangers. So in this example, the bid is asking, so how do you know Kristen? It's a softball question. It's an opening for a conversation that allows you an easy way out if you want to be left to yourself, which is what the one word answer is likely to accomplish for you. Or it's an opening to chat for a little while. So you might say, well, I met Kristen at work. Uh, we used to be on this team and we had this horrible boss. Oops. Now here, this is where you have an opportunity to avoid the second conversation stopper. So you might say, Oh, I met Kristen at work. We used to be on this incredible team, but we had this horrible boss. And here's where you have an opportunity to avoid the second conversation stopper, which is talking about negative things too early in the conversation with something like, you know, well, I first met Kristen at work. We were on this great team together with this horrible boss and Kristen stood by me when he fired me. It might be true, it's a good thing to say about her, but it just leapt over the gate of small talk into topics that are for people who know each other better. And I know getting negative is tempting and it's easy to do because grumbling about things can be an easy way to connect with someone. Misery loves company. Even if the conversation eventually makes you both feel depressed or unsafe with each other, because that's what happens when you hear someone else volunteer negative information about themselves or other people. So when you're just getting to know someone, share information that's positive or neutral or uplifting, like, isn't Kristen great? So that way, at first, you stay away from stories of hardship and terrible bosses and earthquakes and crime and childhood trauma and the world's going to hell in a handbasket and all that stuff. These are all small talk topics that ever so slightly make everyone feel down and anxious. So when you know a person better, you can talk about negatives and the past, but honestly, if you're casting your line out like a fisherman, you know, 
with negatives, the fish you're going to catch, the friends you're going to make are people who like to get negative. And you are only watching this video, I know, because you're trying to improve your life and have better friendships. So you can seek out positive people by focusing on positives, praising things, expressing appreciation, seeing the bright side. I know that that feels shallow to some people, like it's fake, but this is just an opener. These are good small talk openers. And even though they may not have the instant hook and intimacy of a really negative comment that the other person happens to agree with, they function as a placeholder or a space maker for the two of you to bond around where you're trying to go in life. Like once you've defined that, then you talk about, you know, you get to know each other better and then you talk about, here's what's hard for me. Here's what I really don't like. And bonding around where you're trying to go in life especially applies to people who have had a lot of trauma in the past, which is okay. But bonding around trauma, which is what a lot of us have done in the past, you know, we're like, hi, nice to meet you. You know what happened to me? Oh, me too. It was so bad. So doing that, it tends to lead to friendships that are fragile. Bonding around growth and healing is so much better for all that you're trying to do with your life. Okay, the third conversation killer is to lack curiosity about what a person is sharing with you. You listen, but you don't consider what they're saying. They tell you that they volunteer at an animal shelter and you say, oh, that's nice. Well, if you want to help a conversation go next level, be curious, ask them about that. What made you decide to do that? Is it hard when the animals get adopted and you never see them again? Do they all get adopted? Are, are there a lot of animals that need adoption these days? Do you get attached? Is it sad? There's so many things you could be curious about with people, right? The best conversations are like a balloon that gets tossed in a circle. You know, either it goes back and forth between two people or it goes around the group like this. But with each touch point of somebody adding to the conversation, the balloon gets a little higher. You don't shut the balloon down and somebody offers a, you know, I volunteer at the animal shelter and you go, oh, I had a friend who volunteered at the animal shelter. It was horrible there. You know, <laughs> the balloon didn't, didn't go anywhere. The balloon just stopped there. It's a conversation killer. So it's a joy to have the kind of conversation that goes up like a slightly helium filled balloon. And it's rare, especially when there are more than two people, but this is where new friendships can really form because you're both learning something new and you're both in a project of conversation together. Okay. Here's a conversation stopper that really aggravates me though. I'm sure I've done it. And it's when someone tells you something like they've just been accepted to grad school and you miss the cue that this is something to celebrate and ask them about. And instead you tell a story about how this reminds you of when you were in grad school. <laughs> Have you ever done this or had it done to you? It's like you're standing there holding the bag, embarrassed and disappointed with your news. Hey, I went to grad school. And then somebody is, you know, talking about something else. And I had a coworker who did this endlessly and I could share the biggest news and all they'd hear is an opportunity to tell me about another person who had that happen. And I know the stories were meant as a way to say, I relate, but it made me feel completely shut out. I felt alone. I felt not heard. And this would happen in, you know, telling good news and also bad news, you know, like somebody in my family has cancer. Oh, somebody in my family once had cancer, blah, blah, blah. You know, it just, you just don't get heard in that way that constitutes somebody being present and sensitive to you with what you share. So instead, you can think of a conversation less as a way to tell people about yourself and more of a way to learn about another person. And this is so that you don't do that to another person. Just always be, what, what you're trying to avoid here is being interested in what they say so that you can say something that it reminds you of. So instead, you are focusing on what you can learn about them, including whether they're curious about learning about you. That's one of the things you learn when you kind of hang out and be present with somebody and ask them a few questions about things they introduce as important to them. And I know that not everybody is going to ask you about yourself. I know very well. And if you were neglected as a kid and no one was listening to you or celebrating your accomplishments, you might feel sensitive about this and try to push into a conversation with stories about yourself. And the reasons that we accidentally make things about ourselves are often totally innocent. But if you want to connect with people better, you want to aim for, you know, 50, 50 sharing. Not everything has to be a, you tell a story, then I tell a story. That structure, you don't have to follow it. You can do it sometimes. 
It's especially interesting to talk about ideas and phenomena outside of both of your lives and then pepper the conversation with personal stories. And that way you're opening a conversation and you're also sharing a little bit about who you are. It's a good mix. It leaves room for the other person to be part of that too. And in fact, that's more or less how I structure my YouTube videos with that opening at the end to comment. And um, I know it's not really fair. I get to like talk on the tape and it's, you know, right there, like at the very top of the screen and the comments are down below, but it is, it's participatory. I read all the comments. I respond to it over time. So the fifth conversation stopper is not waiting until you understand what the other person is saying before you speak. So you, you might think you agree and then you say, oh yeah, I totally agree. But, but then you say something totally different to what they were saying. And I've been on podcasts like this, for example, where I'm asked something like, what's your take on internal family systems as an approach to trauma? And I say, oh, well, you know, I can't say I resonate with it, but I know a lot of people I respect who consider it helpful and they say good things about it. And then the interviewer says, me too. I really hate internal family systems. And that's embarrassing for me because I didn't say that. I don't want to be known publicly as somebody who hates that. I'm totally supportive of what people do that, you know, helps them heal. So, you know, they didn't wait till they understood what I was saying before they chimed in with agreement. I love being agreed with, but not when it's something I didn't say. So they were just thinking whatever they were thinking. They weren't listening. And then they made everybody else think that I agreed with them and actually People who want to make you look like a bad guy will use this as a conversational malpractice technique, really. They're not innocently, you know, where they ask you what you think about something, you say what you think, and then they rephrase it, reframe it, and make it into the thing that makes you look bad. And they go, oh, so blah, 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 blah. And, you know, we've heard, we've heard a lot of good examples of that. It's all over YouTube. I call it conversational malpractice. And it can be very damaging to other people. It's definitely going to push them away. So it's not a way to connect with people. It's a way to try to prove you're right. And seldom is that the most important thing in a conversation where you're trying to make friends. So when someone does that to you, it doesn't feel good. It doesn't make you want to share more information. It makes you run away from being friends. So if you want to master better conversational skills, listen to people, especially if you ask them a question and be ready to ask more questions so that you can more fully understand what they're saying. Now, most people are really interesting if you pay attention in this way. It's a lovely experience to learn from another person and take what they say with openness. You don't have to agree, actually, to be open to try to understand and sort of see the picture they're painting of what they see in the world, right? And you can let it lift you up a little bit. And when you're up a little bit and you're paying attention, you can connect and talk together about what they're saying. And that makes people feel so heard. Everyone loves that. You will love it. That is what a conversation is. All right. The sixth conversation stopper is giving unsolicited advice. Unless a person you're, you're talking to asks specifically for advice, just don't do it. And whatever your advice is, if it wasn't sought, it's very likely to be perceived as criticism. Now, sometimes people ask me, you know, I really like what I learned from your video or I'm doing your daily practice and I'm trying to get my partner to do it. How do I make him do it? And my answer is always, um, you can suggest to people one time and just say, wow, I'm doing this thing called the daily practice. I think you might find it helpful. Do you want to, do you want to do that with me? And I just know from experience, chances are very good. They'll say, no, they'll say, uh, no, thanks. You, I'm good. You go ahead. <laughs> and, um, and that's your answer. And if you're in a, you know, a marriage or a committed relationship, like a very tight relationship and something is really important to you, I would say ask once. And if they ignore you, you can ask twice. If you ask three times, that's the outer limit of how much you can ask somebody to change, really. And if they don't do it at that point, that is your answer. And I know that's hard to accept. It's hard for me to accept, but that's everything else is pushy. Everything else is trying to make somebody over into an image in your mind of who they should be, which is inherently a criticism. And people are not drawn to it, and it's a bad way to connect. I can sort of hear the voices coming of people saying, yeah, but what if what my partner is doing is unacceptable? And at a certain point, you have to decide whether you will tolerate this thing that you, you don't really like about them or whether it's not okay with you. And you, you've asked them, they've said no, they're not following through, and you have to decide, do you want to be there? Real love 
is does it it does include sometimes exhorting people to change, telling them what a big deal is. Sometimes real love means you step back and you separate because you can't deal with something that they're doing. And you have to ask yourself, you know, do I really love this person as they are? Or do I need to adjust our, our living situation or our arrangement so that I can accept who they are or, you know, move on with my life? And I hope that's not what happens. I, there's a lot of, you know, wiggle room in there. But I'm talking about the way that we sneak in unsolicited advice is something that we really demand of another person, especially in a partner relationship. It can be really toxic. So it's a fine line, isn't it? It doesn't mean that you don't ever tell them, you know what, you, I just cannot deal with you drinking anymore. I really need you to stop. Um, but if you've ever been in a relationship where that something like that was an issue, you know, like, that doesn't mean they stop. And then there you are standing with your ultimatum. So it becomes an inside decision. All right, but back to how to connect. How to connect, it does involve seeing people where they are, accepting them where they are, or you know, keeping your um, opinion about how they need to change minimal and releasing it if they don't choose to adopt your opinion. All right, seven, the seventh conversation stopper. This is my pet peeve. Number seven is what I call Dr. Actually, because actually, <laughs> allow me to contradict what you just said or some tiny detail of what you just said. And I see this sometimes in the comments on YouTube and um, you know, where you're sort of trying to say, you know, you're trying to make a case. Well, so this thing happens and the most important part of it is this. And Dr. Actually focuses on this little detail that you happen to use as an example and tells you what's wrong with that detail. And you're not, you go, yeah, you're just feeling like, yeah, I didn't mean to call the, that little detail into question. I'm trying to make a larger point. Dr. Actually just can't do it. So, or they, they come in and try to debunk something that you said. So if I said, you know, there are many methods that you could use to try to re-regulate your nervous system. And somebody came in and said, actually, there's only two ways to do it. And that might be their opinion and that's fine. But it's like, actually, there's only two. And they are interrupting the point that I'm making that you have choices. You know, there's uh, maybe I'm responding to somebody who has a preference that's different than mine. And I can say, you know, there are many ways. So that doctor actually behavior, it's very common and it's perceived as being a know-it-all and it immediately shuts down the conversation. It's not what, it's not the point the person was trying to make. It's a, it's a contradiction. It's being contrary. It's a refutation of what they were trying to say. And ultimately it's not hearing what they were trying to say. Cause you're down in the weeds trying to say that this, this little piece of what they said isn't legitimate. And you might be right, but if you want to connect with people, you got to just let these things go by sometimes, or maybe later go, by the way, when you mentioned brown sparrows, <laughs> their migratory pattern is actually <laughs> in the spring, not the fall, <laughs> you know, <laughs> something like that. You can tell them later, but it'll, it'll just absolutely derail someone's effort to communicate and connect with you if you keep bringing it up. I think it's a reflex. I think a lot of people who do it, um, they're not doing it because they think they're a know-it-all. They're not doing it because they want to derail the conversation. They just have a low filter on this thing in their mind that goes, Ooh, that little detail that you just said, it's not true. And that filter's not there to just like, it's okay. You can let it go by. It's, you know, it's, it's peripheral to the point that your friend is making. Does that make sense? Okay. So if you are giving an opinion, it's more fair game to say, okay, I hear your opinion, but I have a different opinion. And when someone is just innocently telling you about themselves, you want to take care not to get in there and stomp on what they just said. You don't want to correct them or contradict them or appear to one-up them. If somebody reveals a little fact about their life, if they say, you know what, I'm thinking of buying an electric car. You don't have to be doctor actually and tell them, actually, electric cars are not all they're cracked up to be. Why blah, 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 you know? You don't have to do that. You can go, ah, oh, interesting. Um, you, can, you can ask them, what makes you interested in an electric car? What an interesting choice. Do you think it would be, you know, would it help you with your commute? Would you use it for everything? Um, what about long distance? 
you can ask questions and that opens the connection and the conversation with the other person rather than shut it down with your knowledge of the downside of electric cars, for example. I really don't mean to bring up electric cars, but it's something, it's something that people debate, certainly, right? If you do the doctor actually thing, even if you're contradicting them about something they're saying that you in fact know is wrong, you don't have to go there. This is not a transportation policy conference. It's a conversation where you have the opportunity to connect and get to know another person. You don't, I mean, does it really matter to you what kind of car they want? Probably not. And if you want to open the possibility of friendship, you can open up the conversation when they tell you about their thought about the car that they're thinking of by asking them about that. Seek to know their point of view when you're getting to know somebody. Not to be persuaded necessarily. It's, you know, this is not a contest. You don't have to agree in the end, but you're asking questions to know this person and to see if you can hear the point of why they told you this. And who knows, you might learn something from them, but that's not important. When we correct and criticize what other people are expressing, we may completely miss the point. And for them, that feels alienating even humiliating, and it shuts down the conversation. And this is really the eighth conversation stopper. When you correct and contradict someone, it can embarrass them, especially in a group conversation. You can also embarrass people by being sarcastic or abruptly changing the subject or turning your attention away from them when they're in the middle of talking. You wanna be sensitive to that. Kind people seek ways to help people feel included and appreciated and heard. There is a place for debate, but it's not when you're just getting to know someone and you're working on building a new friendship. Okay, the ninth conversation stopper is when you leave no room for the other person to talk. And yes, this happens if you talk nonstop, but it can happen even in balanced conversations. If you're an extrovert and they're an introvert, you will hear every pause that they have. You know, introverts pause sometimes to sort of process information. But we extroverts hear that as, oh, you're done talking. You're ready for me to say something. I've got something. As it happens, here we go. <laughs> you might even feel uncomfortable during pauses. It's, it's a little weird, you know, when you, when you don't talk that way. But some people only share what's on their mind and in their heart when there's a pause. So give it a try. See if the other person opens up. And if you realize that you've been doing too much of the talking, you can apologize and ask them for their opinion on something. Ask them for their take on the, whatever you were just saying. So finally, the 10th way to stop a conversation is by not showing other people in a way they understand that you're listening, that you're interested in what they're saying, and that you approve of them. Now, maybe you don't approve of someone and you don't want the conversation to turn into a friendship, but assuming you do, you are interested in friendship, uh, you may need to intentionally show them these feelings by keeping eye contact, nodding, and saying friendly things like, I'm so glad you said that, or uh, you have a really good point. If it feels artificial to you to give people this affirmative validation for what they're saying when they're speaking, chances are you really do need to add it to your repertoire of how you respond to people. Giving people a little validation and like, I get it, I hear you, good point, it really helps them. And it's a good thing to know how to do, even if it doesn't come naturally to you. A lot of people, because of past trauma or maybe neurodivergence or just having a stoic personality, they don't give very much affirmation to other people. And you might need to consciously pay attention to their vibe, the tone of what they're saying, so that you can at least roughly match their tone. Now, I've noticed that some people who are kind of stoic like that and they don't tend to give praise, they still like getting praise. So I'm not saying manipulate them, but just like everybody, they like to be appreciated and validated, right? Not everybody has the social grace to give that to others, but you're learning it now. So, you know, good things are about to happen around you. So I'm not saying be manipulative. I'm saying to keep in mind how helpful it is to people to see that you are listening and feel that you're on the wave, on their wavelengths and that you know and you appreciate what they're saying. It's a kindness and this will attract into your life more friends than you know what to do with. 